Welcome to our lecture online. Now let's take a look at how we do line integrals when we have a vector field. So in essence, what we're going to do here is try to find the work done. And the way that's done is to integrate the path of the displacement, which is indicated here by this red curve going from A to B, through an area here that's defined by a vector field. Now ultimately, the work done will be defined as the integral over the curve of the dot product of the force that is illustrated there on the graph dotted with the derivative of the position vector. All right, now what does that look like? First of all, we have a vector field defined here. We have the force is defined as x squared in the i direction or the x direction minus x times y in the j direction. So it looks a little bit like what these black arrows indicate. So you can see the vector field is to the right and downward as we go higher up. The negative x, y in the j direction starts playing an effect. And you can see that at the bottom here, close to the x-axis, the vector, the vector field is to the right. It increases as you go to the right. But as you go up, this j term right here begins to turn the direction of the force. And so we're going to be traveling pretty well against the force. And so we'd expect to find a negative answer when we do this. Now, we're going to move along the quarter circle. And so we can define the position vector in terms of what we call the t vector. Now, in this case, the t is really the angle, the angle defined from the x-axis on up. And so what we do here is we take our base position vector, which is normally written in terms of x and y as x times the i vector plus y times the, the unit j vector. And so if we then replace x with cosine of t and y with the sine of t, the position vector then will be written as this. With the, and so we're going to use what we call the parametric equations. If we now take the derivative of the position vector, which we're going to need to plug in right here, that will then, of course, be the derivative of the cosine is the negative sign. Derivative, the derivative of the sine is the cosine. So this is now the derivative of our position vector. And so we know that the work done is then uh, defined by the integral of the force times the derivative of the position vector, dr. And that can be written as this. The force is now going to be written in terms of the parameterized variable, t, or the angle t. And then, of course, we have the derivative of the position vector times dt. So this is the definition of how to find the work done or how to find the line integral in general when we have a vector field. Now, notice that if we replace x and y by the cosine and the sine, then the force, the force equation or the force field can be defined as follows. So now we're going to plug that into our integral and we get the following. This is now equal to the integral. Now the limits are going to be for the variable t or the angle. So the limits are going to be from 0 to pi over 2 because it's simply a quarter circle. So from 0 to pi over 2. And then we have the force vector in terms of the parameterized variable. So this will be the cosine squared of t in the i direction minus the cosine of t times the sine of t in the j direction. And we'll put parentheses around that because we're going to take this and multiply it via the dot product with the derivative of the position vector, which is right here. So that would be the minus sine of t in the i direction plus the cosine of t in the j direction. And we still need a dt. Where does that dt come from? Well, when we have r prime, that's really the derivative of r with respect to t, that would be dr dt, and then we move the dt over, over here, and that's where that dt comes from. Now, when we have two vectors and we do a dot product, we multiply the i components together, and we multiply the j components together. And of course, if there's z components, then you also multiply the z components together. In this case, it's simply a, a two-dimensional vector. And the dot product results in a scalar quantity, so the i and the j's will then disappear. So this becomes equal to the integral from 0 to pi of, and now let's see here, we have the cosine squared times the negative sine, so that becomes the negative cosine squared of t times the sine of t, and of course the i's then disappear. And then we have the negative cosine sine times the cosine, so that becomes again 
the negative cosine square of t times the sine of t and the whole thing times the dt and then we realize that this is exactly the same thing so we add them together we'll have a negative 2 which goes outside the integral sign so this becomes equal to a negative 2 times the integral from 0 to pi and of course we have the cosine square of t times the sine of t cosine square of t times the sine of t times dt now this is a fairly easy integral to integrate we need the cosine of t uh, let's say that this, the cosine of t is equal to u then du would be the let's see here the derivative of the sine is the cosine so the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine so I should have left a little bit of room here because what I really need is I need a negative sine of t here so I need a negative sine of t and of course then this becomes a positive because I need to multiply this by negative 1 and this by negative 1 so here I have the cosine square of t and this would be the, the differential of the cosine so now I can go ahead and integrate that and the integral will look as follows so this becomes equal to 2 times the cosine square of t integrated becomes the cosine q of t divided by 3 the cosine cube of t divided by 3 evaluated from 0 to pi over 2 and did I write pi I really meant to write pi over 2 this is the limits pi over 2 and then when I evaluate when I plug in the upper limit the cosine of 90 degrees or pi over 2 is equal to 0 so this becomes equal to 2 thirds times 0 and then when I plug in the lower limit the cosine of 0 is equal to 1 even if I cube it I still get a 1 but I subtract it because it's the lower limit so I get minus 1 so essentially this is equal to a negative 2 thirds and that represents the work done by moving through the vector field from A to B along this quarter circle path here and so that's how we use line integrals when we have vector fields we define the force or the the function here we define it as a variable now in this case if we're moving along a curved path instead of using x and y variables we're going to use the parameterized variables t which re represents the angle so maybe I should write that on here so this right here this is the variable t which is the angle relative to the x-axis so now we have x and y can be defined as a cosine of t and the sine of t assuming that from here to there is equal to 1 because I don't have a constant in front there so then instead of writing r like this the position vector I can write it in terms of the cosine and the sine of t I take the derivative of that and then by definition the work done is equal to the vector field represented by the force vector here dotted with the derivative of the position vector or this may be a, a better way to look at it it's simply the vector field in terms of t the position the derivative of the position of, in terms of t the dot product times dt integrated over the curve and that will then give you the work done and that's a really good example of how we do line integrals using vector fields that's how it's done